Hey everybody, welcome to episode 42 of the Ask Staff Show, where we answer your Volkswagen Audi questions. On this episode, we talk about what engine vacuum should be on your car, can the dealer tell if you're tuned, and diagnosing secondary air injection systems. Conan via shopdap.com says, I'm curious as to what you believe the vacuum pressure should be on a 2006 GTI with the FSI engine that's running a GIAC tune in some bolt-ons like a Miltec exhaust, downpipe, and an S3 intercooler. And I think that's about it. I need to know of coil packs, but uh, that shouldn't affect vacuum pressure. The car boosts well and holds at 17 PSI, but vacuum is just 11 PSI. I've seen anything from 11 is normal to 20 is correct. Any help here would be much appreciated. I love the site and can't believe I've had the car so many years. I'm just now finding it. Thanks in advance. Okay, Conan. So uh, first thing, uh, appreciate the feedback about the site. And again, we appreciate you considering us per, considering us for your purchases. In regards to vacuum issues or is that correct vacuum? Um, no, that is absolutely not the correct vacuum. As you mentioned, normal vacuum should be around 20. Um, it will vary depending on a few different things. So uh, when you turn your air conditioning on, the vacuum will drop because it engages a heavier load on the engine, which will then drop engine vacuum. Uh, that's pretty normal, but you're talking about maybe dropping from like to around 17 or 18 as opposed to 20, um, not 11. 11 is definitely significantly low for engine vacuum. Now, the one thing I'll say is you said you know you need ignition coils. And my first thought on that is something that maybe is a little concerning, and I don't really know uh, because you didn't really elaborate on that. If you have a misfire, meaning your car is uh, misfiring and that's why you think you need ignition coils, then that would cause a low engine vacuum situation because whenever you have a cylinder that's not operating properly, obviously the engine is not uh, completely functioning properly, and let's say you have one dead cylinder completely, then that's going to then drop your engine vacuum significantly. So uh, if that's the case, then you might want to look at that, replace your coils um, to address that. If the engine, if it's not a heavy misfire, it's probably not causing your, your vacuum related problem, especially if your vacuum is steady, you'd be running pretty bad or you probably should be running pretty bad as far as the engine um, at 11 uh, inches of vacuum for sure. So. If it's not misfire related, then it's definitely going to be vacuum leak related, which you might want to look at either the PCV valve, uh, which is a common thing on that. And you commented on our site on one of our articles. So I'm not sure specifically what article it was, but if it's not the PCV valve article, you can check that out. Um, I'll link that here where you can take a look. Or uh, if it's not that a common leak point for vacuum on the FSI is the uh, brake booster hose that runs from the intake manifold uh, to the brake booster and somewhere else, I forget where. Um, but that's also a common leak point. We actually did a DIY on how to do that on an FSI engine, which I'll link to the video here where you can take a look at that. Um, those are going to be the most common things, but I would say you likely have an issue of some kind and something to keep in mind. If you have a vacuum leak, you almost certainly have a boost leak. So, um, fixing that problem is going to get you more power as well. Joshua Padilla via YouTube says, Hey guys, I bought some parts from you guys and installed with your videos. I think DAP is doing an awesome job. My question is about Mark 7 Stage 1 software upgrades. I watched one of your videos going over it, but I wanted to know if I install software but take it off when getting it serviced at the dealer. Will they know that the car had software mods at one point? I want to be able to get the most out of my warranty if a problem does arise. And what about potential problems with the dealer updating software and me downloading the software mod back in my car again? Thanks. Okay, Josh. Uh, first of all, thanks so much for the purchases and the feedback. Uh, we appreciate it very much. In regards to your questions about tuning software, um, so what I assume you're referring to was our top five mods video, which we mentioned that a tune is the number one modification. Obviously, that is the case. Um, if you were looking at the Uniconnect system, the Uniconnect, for anybody who's not familiar, is gives you the ability to flash your vehicle on your own. You would then, if you wanted to take it in for service of some kind, you can flash it back to stock. Uh, the question is obviously, will they know if the vehicle has been flashed? So this is a really complicated topic. Um, maybe I should do a video specifically about this thing alone, but 
I'm going to try to get as in-depth as I can. This might be a little bit long-winded. At this point, nobody really knows why vehicles get flagged for TD1. If you're not familiar, TD1 is basically the code that uh, is flagged in the VW Audi system that identifies that the vehicle has been modified. Um, I think TD1 is actually maybe specifically ECU, but it may just be complete vehicle modification saying, hey, this car has been modded. Since nobody knows, and that's including dealers, because keep in mind, dealers don't get a mass disclosure. They will have more understanding of it because they see a direct feedback loop that's like, okay, this car didn't get flagged for TD1 and we know it's modified, or, uh, or this car did get flagged under XYZ circumstance. So they would know a little bit more, but they still don't have all the details that get broken down as to how a car gets flagged for TD1. I said all that to say this, um, as far as we know, and we've contacted Unitronic to talk about this, there is no Unitronic car that we're aware of at this time that has been flashed back to stock that has been flagged for TD1. Now, uh, if you do know of a car that has, please leave in the comments below the whole circumstance. I really would love to hear about that, those specifics that caused that to happen. Um, that's the basic general consensus that could actually change over time because we don't know the parameters. They may end up changing the parameters so that uh, it's a constant moving target and, you know, uh, we won't really have a clear picture of what that looks like. The one thing I'll say is um, tuning has become a lot more prevalent um, in dealers. And I came from a dealer. We were one of the first, uh, when I brought tuning to the dealer I was working at, we were one of the first dealers uh, to do that. Not the first, but one of them. And it was very taboo at that time. It was something that a lot of people were afraid of and nervous. And I just said, you know what, we're going to do this and we'll try to figure out how to make this work. Um, because it's becoming such a prevalent thing in dealers, dealers are not giving people a hard time over nothing. And that's really the big key with it is, it's not that tuning your cars always has potential to void your warranty. It's really, you don't want to get into these battles over things that shouldn't even be a battle, but are. And let me give an example. Um, 2.0T TSI engines, the older models. Um, they had issues with diverter valves. It was a pretty common problem. They had an early revision that had a rubber diaphragm that would tear. I have heard of stories where dealers said, oh, this car has been modified. Oh, we can't, tune, we can't replace your diverter valve. It's bad because the car has been tuned. Although they probably replaced 15 earlier that week that were on stock cars that hadn't been modified. So that was a problem and that's really the biggest concern that I always think of when it comes to tuned cars and dealers is dealers who are frankly just stupid and, and blame tunes for literally everything you can imagine, um, including a misfire or any, any really basic problem that might happen, they'll just automatically just look directly at the tune. And part of that is because they don't have the uh, familiarity to address that and part of it is just because um, they have this this misconception in their head about what it means. The other component to this about flagging for TD1 and someone's going to say, oh, well, there's a flash counter that counts up every time the vehicle has been flashed and that's how they're going to know and flag it for TD1. I don't think that that's something that's used at this point and here's why. Um, vehicles often have software updates um, and a lot of the MQB stuff, especially the 1.8T because that camshaft issue, um, there were some software updates that happened on those. I don't think the systems that flag cars for TD1 are, are so complicated that they connect with, here are all the updates that this car should have had and here's what the flash counter should be. So if it doesn't match up, auto flag for TD1. Um, I, that, I may be wrong about that, but I don't think that's the case because that's kind of a complicated system that I think would not be something that they would dive super deep into to try to avoid. I don't think that they're actively trying to um, avoid people's warranties. So, like I said, at this point, we are not aware of any cars that have gone to dealers and been flashed back to stock and been flagged for TD1. At this point, that's really all we can say about it, and it rings true now until we hear otherwise. Um, I know that's not the perfect answer, but it definitely is the only answer I can really offer you at this point. 
In regards to uh, software updates and flashing back, um, if a vehicle is, has a software update on it, most dealers are gonna let you know before they do it, but sometimes I've heard of stories where dealers just do it and blow out people's tunes. It's not that big of a deal. If you have a Uniconnect and you're flashing your car at home anyway, no big deal, you can just re reload your software and you're done. If you don't have a Uniconnect or you don't have Unitronic or whatever, then you'll have to bring it back to get it flashed at the dealer who did it originally. If that dealer may or may not charge labor for flashing, so that's something to be aware of that you could end up having to pay for the tune to be put back on there once you do that, and that's gonna vary depending on where you go. But if they blow the tune out, not a big deal. It can always be put back on there. So hopefully that answers your questions and uh, thanks so much. Jimmy Jackson via email says, so my 2010 VWCC check engine light is on and shows error code P2432. The only thing I could find was secondary air injection system airflow slash pressure sensor circuit low bank one. How does one go about addressing this issue? Also, I was reading that part of the emissions, so that it should be covered under warranty for 10 years or 100,000, whichever comes first. Not sure if this is true or not. If it's under warranty, how do you go about getting the dealership to cover it and or let them know if it's covered and you're not being adva taken advantage of? Any help would be great. Okay, Jimmy, so in regards to diagnosing your issue, um, so I've said this before, I'll say it again. If diagnosing cars is as simple as knowing a fault code and, and then knowing the part to replace, then technicians wouldn't even exist. We would just have some guy who just replaces parts on cars and doesn't know anything about cars. Um, since that's the case, I can't really give you actionable advice, but I can lead you in a direction of where how to go. First of all, anytime diagnosing a car, you have to understand how a system works before you can accurately diagnose it. Uh, good news for you, I actually shot a video talking about how secondary air injection works, which you, I'll link to here, and you can check out that video, which will explain kind of a basic overview of how the system works. In regards to that model, uh, I believe that car actually does have a pressure sensor, which would sit between the combination valve, which is near the exhaust, and the secondary air injection pump, which is in the front of the car. There's gonna be a pipe between the two and there's going to be a sensor mounted to that. That's going to be a pressure sensor to identify if there's an issue in the system. If, the, uh, if you wanna diagnose that, you will need a VAGCOM and to go down the road of looking into the system, uh, VAGCOM gives you the ability to access what's called output diagnostic test mode. That gives you the ability to activate different components in the system to see if they're working. For example, um, you can press a button, go to output diagnostic test mode, and activate the secondary air injection pump. It will run on off, on off, on off, so that you'll know if the pump is working or and or if it's even getting power to know if that's what the issue is. You then have to, if you identify, oh, the pump isn't working, you then have to track down, is it not getting power? Does it have a good ground? Uh, is the pump bad? You know, all those type of things then you would have to go down the line addressing each component in the system to track down specifically what the problem was. Um, in regards to your question about warranty, uh, the secondary air injection pump is not under the emissions warranty. Um, it's actually under the standard uh, engine warranty and would not be covered. So, uh, and I did reach out to uh, my buddy Charles, the home mechanic, if you're not familiar with him, look him up. Uh, he's a VW tech. Just to confirm, because I did believe that only catalytic converters, as far as I'm aware, and then on diesel cars, DPFs and stuff like that, are involved with the uh, extended warranty that would be found on emissions, uh, which I don't know if it's 100. I, generally, it's 880, as far as I'm aware. But um, yeah, so it's not going to be covered in warranty. You will have to track down the problem. Uh, if you're not, if you don't have all those tools I talked about or the knowledge to track down that stuff, you will have to have somebody diagnose it to figure out what's going on. Roll D. Calero via YouTube says, I have a question. I have a 2015 Mark 7 GTI with 18,000 miles and I'm getting clutch chatter when my car is idling. As soon as I press in the clutch slightly, the chatter goes away and I'm always having to rev it high in order to get the car moving from first so it doesn't stall on me. I'm not so sure if this is the clutch itself that's causing this because it's been worn or if this is a factory problem. And if so, can I adjust the clutch pedal or do something to make it go away? I really love this car and I don't want time to make repairs, so I just bought it this weekend. Thanks ahead of time. 
Okay, so this issue um, sounds super unfortunate. If you just purchased the car, here's what I feel like probably happened. Uh, the previous owner purchased a car that's a manual. They either don't have enough experience driving a manual or they beat the death out of the car and then smoke the clutch. Um, they then looked at what the cost of replacing it was and decided that they didn't want to pay that money because obviously replacing a clutch requires uh, expensive parts plus removing the transmission. And they decided they didn't want to do it, so they traded the car in. You then purchased that car and now you own a car that needs a clutch. Um, it sounds like that's the case. I don't know that for sure. You will, my advice would be get a second opinion to make sure that that is true before you start going down the road of replacing the clutch. There is no adjustment for clutches. They are self-adjusting pretty much, uh, for 15 plus years on cars, um, on, on VW models. I'll link to the clutches we have available performance wise for that clutch. If you're looking to upgrade here where you can take a look, but sounds like a really unfortunate situation. You may want to go back to who you purchased it from because uh, that is something that's going to be a really significant repair. And you can t discuss that with them. If it is a reputable place, um, they should at least give you assistance of some kind. Um, unless you, unless you purchase the vehicle, um, as is, which in which case they would have no liability to uh, cover that type of repair. Staz Loban via YouTube says, I'm gonna search for some Iridium spark plugs for my 2006 Audi A4 with the 2.0T FSI engine, and I came across the NGK BKR 7 EIX plugs. Do you think that they will be a good choice? When I went to AutoZone the other day, they told me that the original plugs are Iridium and they recommend me going with Iridium over Platinum. What should I do and what plugs will be better at performance? The engine is bone stock. Please help, thanks. Okay, so Stas, in regards to those spark plugs on your Audi, uh, the BKR7 EIX plugs are a very popular plug for that car. Um, it is something that we offer as well for both two liter turbo engines, FSI and TSIs, uh, both take the same plugs. We offer a few different ones, genuine ones, Bosch ones, the BKR7 EIX, and then there's some upgrade plugs for people who have bigger turbos, um, which would be colder heat ranges than those. Um, in regards to are they okay choices, the BKRX is good. Uh, any of the ones we offer, we've always been super happy with and we've our, our customers are always happy with. Uh, in regards to spark plugs from places like AutoZone, they offer wide varieties of plugs a lot of times. And so it's tough to say with a blanket statement, oh, any plug you get from them is gonna be fine or not fine. Um, the one thing I'll say is, from my time in the business in dealers, a lot of people go to places like that and buy, they just say, oh, like, oh, what's the best, what's the cheapest plug I can get for my car or what's a reasonable price middle of the road plug? And they end up with something like Auto Lights or uh, some other brand like that. And they end up with phantom misfires that they can't fix. And because they think they have brand new spark plugs and sometimes ignition coils, because a lot of the ones coils you get from places like that are aftermarket. Um, they end up with these misfires that they can't figure out. And then they end up bringing it to the dealer eventually to address it. And then a dealer pulls the plug and the coil is like, Oh, this stuff's aftermarket. We need to get good stuff in here so that we can properly diagnose it. And that ends up addressing the issue a lot of the time um, because they just don't run well on those cheap plugs. Um, I couldn't tell you why, cause I'm not an engineer. So going with a quality plug is okay. I'll say this, that a lot of times when you go to places like AutoZone or, or any of those type of places, when you go look at their better quality plugs can compare them pricing wise to either the dealer or someone like us, they're always almost always more expensive. So it's just something to consider their cheaper stuff is cheaper, but their, their quality stuff, if you compare the same stuff is often much more expensive. So you might want to consider um, shopping around for that stuff. Uh, I'll put a link to uh, the plugs we offer here and you can take a look. In regards to upgrading or, or how they work for performance, because you have a stock engine, I would say either one of those plugs is fine. Um, I, any of the plugs we offer are fine and you wouldn't really need to change any plugs as far as upgrading to get better performance because the car is stock. Really, you just want to get a quality plug that's going to perform the way it was intended. Thank you for watching episode 42 of the Ask Daft Show. If you have any feedback about the questions answered in this show, be sure to leave it in the comments below. If you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more like it.